We overestimated Russia, we wildly underestimated uh, Ukrainian. For example, you have even several Vishivankas, <laughs> so you post it on your Twitter. And I want to distill some of this spirit and bring it back to America. You know, I mean, Russia has not changed in mentality, it's not changed in identity form since basically, you know, the Mongols. Well, uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Will Russia fight corruption? Sometime. <laughs> Will Russia fight corruption? Smiling the whole way back in Ukraine, you know, I mean, this, that's my great dream is to one day own a beach house on Crimea, you know, my, my, my Ukrainian getaway. <laughs> if that's Russophobia, fine. Okay, so today in our studio we have Paul Massaro. Uh, Paul, you are well known as an ambassador of Ukraine, especially in Twitter community. Um, can you explain how did that happen? Oh my God, I don't know how it happened. I mean, it, it's, a, it's as much a mystery to me as I think as it is to anyone else. I mean, I, you know, I when this when this awful full scale invasion started, I mean, I, I was at my place and and sort of watching at the time Putin's Hitlerian speech. I'm sure everybody here sort of remembers it as he you know, declared his intention to wipe Ukraine off the map and wipe Ukrainians off the map and declared war on, I mean, in my opinion, really all of us, declared war on democracies, declared war on freedom. Um, I just started tweeting like crazy. And now I've been tweeting before that, right? I mean, I've been tweeting like a, like a DC expert tweets with sort of threads of whatever, 20, you know, 20 tweet threads on here's how sanctions work and here's what's going on, here's this. And, and, and after that happened, I just, it was kind of rapid fire, just kind of very raw, I think. And I think that's really maybe what resonated with people. I think I filled maybe a, you know, a desire to hear what was going on at the time, this time of extreme confusion. And over those first few days, as we sort of stayed up every night, you know, seeing if Kiev would be uh, free in the morning. And uh, it was every single time. And it was just, I mean, I, I remember that so vividly. Um, but it was around that time that, you know, I was getting like 10,000 followers every few hours and it was like, what, what's going on? You know, where is all this interest coming from? And at that time, you don't really think about that. You're just thinking about, oh my God, this is, and, and, and really is how I've seen it since it's happened is this is the end of what we would term, I think, the post Cold War. This is a, the birth of a new paradigm. February 24th changed everything. And I think really we're still recognizing that. Um, but we all need to get there, that we are in a completely new paradigm now. But there, are, there were not very good predictions for Kyiv and for Ukraine, especially in the US. Uh, so you, you said that you were waiting that is Kyiv free or is it captured? Um, when uh, these uh, things changed? Yeah, I mean, well, of course we thought, I mean, we had General Milley coming to Congress and everything else. You saw it in the press you know, briefing, Kiev's gonna fall in three days, you know, it's got three days. And I mean, you know, I think we, in one sense, we allowed Russia to infiltrate our narratives. You know, we, we didn't understand Russia, we didn't understand Ukraine, we overestimated Russia, we wildly underestimated uh, Ukrainian potential. And I think that after three days, you know, after the three day mark, it started getting kind of like, oh my God, are they? Are they gonna win this? You know, and then, and then, it, and then it, as time went on, it got to a week, it got to, it was like, oh my God, Ukraine is gonna defend itself. I mean, you know, the, the, the minute you knew things really had changed was when Zelensky and his advisors came out, that, that legendary video, the, the, the president, president tout, you know, that, that was, that was, it was, it was unbelievable. When you saw that, that was the moment that I think for me, I think for a lot of people, but for me in particular, it was kind of like, Oh my God, these people, this guy, this is, this is out of a history book. I've never seen this kind of political leadership. I've never seen such a heroic people in my life. I mean, listen, I mean, I'm a, I'm a kid of the postmodern, post Cold War, right? I mean, every act of heroism, every act of bravery or courage or leadership is in the history books. You know, we've never seen it really. I was born after the fall of the Soviet Union, you know, um, it's been this kind of weird malaise. And then suddenly out of nowhere, y'all come, you know, and it's just like, oh my God, this is what courage is. And at that point for me, it was clear that, you know, Ukraine wasn't about to get conquered. In fact, you know, Ukraine was gonna, was gonna win. 
you were one of the persons who spread Ukrainian narratives, especially in your Twitter. And uh, as I saw, for example, you have tweets even in Ukrainian language. <laughs> Uh, do you learn it or do you know it <laughs> no, or do I, you use translator? I, I don't speak Ukrainian. It's not a translator, yet. though. Yet. Uh, not yet. Yeah, but it's not a translator, though. So I'll, I'll, I want to let's keep some mystery about it there, you know. Um, but yes, I do periodically, infrequently um, throw out a Ukrainian tweet. And, and I mean, I do. I have been uh, uh, voraciously <laughs> devouring uh, uh, all I can learn about Ukraine. And I mean, culturally, historically, um, I mean, everybody here probably knows Serhiy Plokhy's The Gates of Europe, highly recommended, you know, any anything one can learn about this country, because it's like, oh, my God, this is this is the place. This is this is the place where, you know, I think the next paradigm is going to be is already being born one that prizes values that for me are really central freedom you know bravery heroism independence yeah we can see it for example you have even several bishvankas <laughs> so you post it on your twitter <laughs> on your instagram so everyone can see that you stay with ukraine for example and maybe you have some advisor or um, some person who are deep in Ukrainian context and can advise it to you. Uh, no, I mean, I, you know, I have, I have Ukrainian friends, you know, um, I, I'll say, I mean, what attracts me to Ukraine and what, what has made me, I'm, I think, so committed to the Ukrainian cause here is I, it's, it's my cause. I mean, I'm an American patriot. You know, I mean, I, I, you don't just miraculously end up working for the American government. You seek that out. You know, I mean, I. I believe in what I see as really deep, consistent American values since 1776 of, that's sort of our revolution, you know, the founding of our country of freedom, of self-determination, you know, of courage in the face of tyranny. And I've always been looking for these in America. It's like, where are these things? You know, obviously we have our myths, you know, particularly World War II or our fight against the Brits or even the abolition of slavery and the Civil War and all this kind of stuff. But there's nothing modern there. It feels like we're, you know, we're, we're in this kind of weird, and I don't think I need to, you know, it's no secret, we're in a strange malaise right now in the United States, deep polarization, very, a lot of, a lot of anger. Um, but I see these values in Ukrainians. And when, I, when I'm in Ukraine, I feel more American uh, than anywhere in the world. I mean, it's really amazing. I feel like I want to, I want to distill some of this spirit and bring it back to America. So I think the, my support for Ukraine is really an extension of my, my, my American patriotism, my belief in American values, um, which are to me really universal values and which I see um, displayed all over Ukraine and by every Ukrainian in a way that I only wish <laughs> sometimes they were displayed in the United States. Have you seen some similarities maybe between Americans and Ukrainians? Oh, so many. I mean, there's, to me, there's no country in the world more similar. And it's amazing, right? Because, because you wouldn't think so. I mean, most Americans until the full-scale invasion didn't even know where Ukraine was. And yet here it is. But I think there's reasons for that. You know, I mean, I think that we're both kind of, they're, they're, we're products of independence wars against and independence movements against larger empires, right? In our case, the British Empire, in your case, the Russian Empire. And we're also kind of frontiersmen, you know? And I think that, you know, cowboys and Cossacks, I, come, I sometimes call it, you know, there's kind of a, there's kind of a culture of freedom that's deeply uh, instilled in each one of us. And whereas you look at the normal European state model, which is kind of, you know, ethnicity, religion, language, Ukraine has a much more American style of identity, which is a values-based identity. You know, it's much more about, well, there's a diversity. We were between empires. There's different languages and different ethnicities and different religions, a high level of tolerance. But we're all united around a common set of values of freedom, of independence. Um, so in that sense, I actually think there's no country in the world, uh, no two countries in the world more similar than the United States and Ukraine. You have mentioned that before the full-scale invasion, people in America didn't even know where Ukraine is situated. And what about now? What people in America know about Ukraine? Well, I think we're learning a lot. You know, I mean, there's still those that have no clue. And I think most of those that have no clue are actually those who have been most vehemently opposed to uh, to supporting Ukraine. I mean, it's people that are maybe more anti-establishment in their views. Um, and, you know, if the establishment wants it, then I don't, you know, and it doesn't really matter what it is, you know. Um, but I think those that have learned maybe the first thing about Ukraine are absolutely taken with Ukraine and are like, oh, my God, this place 
exists, you know, like, I mean, it's, understand, I mean, I don't, well, I don't need to tell you, because I know every Ukrainian understands this, that Russia has made it in a major foreign policy goal to define Ukrainian identity, what it means abroad, and to push narratives of Ukraine as this kind of corrupt backwater, oh, you don't really need to know about it, it's kind of our neighborhood, we'll take care of it, you know. Um, and now that these narratives are breaking apart and kind of the Ukrainian narrative is shining through, um, I think more and more people in America, but also all over the world are recognizing, you know, it's just like, oh my God, this amazing people has been there the whole time. They've of course been stuck under this crust of Russian colonization and Russia's centuries long um, attempt to eradicate Ukrainian identity, but it's still there stronger than ever. And now everybody can see it clearly and it's just, it's, it's glorious. I mean, it's, it's amazing to see. Yeah, but if we speak, for example, about you in particular, it seems that you know about Ukraine like more than typical American. You can even post some humor, some jokes <laughs> about Ukraine, post some photos with Bavovna, <laughs> which is not so easy to explain to the foreigner what is that. Uh, from where do you know this information? Well, I, 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 I listen to Ukrainians. And, 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 I, and I've, I mean, it's, I've learned it all from Ukrainians, obviously, you know. Um, I, um, I encourage everybody to listen to Ukrainians. And in fact, I think one of our big failures has precisely been not listening to Ukrainians. I think for the longest time, our knowledge of this region, Central and Eastern Europe, has come from experts who listen to Moscow and who have relationships with Russia and who have this kind of you know, kind of great powers n narrative of, mm -hmm. well, Washington talks to Berlin, talks to Moscow, talks to Beijing, and we'll organize the world according to, and it's ridiculous, you know? And I mean, this entire time, if we'd been listening, I mean, I, you know, I've been working on this region for 10 years, you know? And I think I was more hawkish than others toward Russia, but I still wasn't hawkish enough, nobody was, you know, because we needed to really be listening to the Ukrainians, to the Poles, to the Lithuanians, to the Estonians, to the Latvians, to the Finns, to the Czechs, you know, because everybody was saying this, you know, everybody was screaming this out and so many people were dismissed. So many people were told, well, you're just traumatized. And it's like, it's, it's such a goofy thing in hindsight. And it's so like victim blaming in hindsight. It's like, like these peoples know Russia better than anybody. You know, and, and we should have been listening. If we were listening, we probably could have deterred this war. Do you think that these things will change, will be changed after this war? They're, they're already changing rapidly, rapidly. And, and nothing succeeds like success, right? I mean, seeing Ukraine fight back, seeing Ukraine defeat, decisively defeat Russia in, in a number of engagements already and well on its way to liberating its entire country and in, 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 in winning this war, I mean, that is, even if you don't want to, <laughs> even if you're not like me and you don't feel this really deep uh, solidarity with the Ukrainian people, you're just gonna be forced to recognize the reality that what Ukraine is doing is working and what Russia has done is not working. <laughs> you know, that the Russian model is broken, it's failing, it's falling on its face. Uh, and the Ukrainian model is succeeding in showing the world what a free people can do. When I asked my friend about you and asked, what do you think about this person? Uh, she said that I think that he is more Russophobic than I am. <laughs> uh, can you comment to this? Do you agree with this statement? Um, look, I mean, Russia, I think, I think part of our problem has been not understanding Russia. You know, I think we've, we've there's, there's this kind of inherent part of the American mentality in our liberal sensibilities and our way of kind of seeing the world. Look, America is the land of second chances. You know, we want to see individuals and rightfully so. It's part of my culture that I really believe in. You know, I mean, my ancestors were poor Italian Americans who came over and built a wonderful life for themselves. And look, I mean, like after 1,500 years of farming in Southern Italy, you know, I get to do this job. That's amazing, you know? And I mean, I get to, so it's, so it's a, America is just this land of opportunity and we want to believe that we can talk to Russia and we want to believe that we can change Russia and we want to believe that the individual Russian, that there's good in the individual Russian, because that's, that's what Americans want to believe. You know, we want to believe, and I think it's a good impulse, but it's one that Russia constantly takes advantage of. You know, 
You give an inch to the Russians, they'll take a mile. Every single time you do a good deed toward the Russians, they will abuse you for it. You know, they will take it from you. And they've always done that. They've always done it to us. They've done it to you. They've done it to everybody. And we need to stop making the same mistake. You know, it's the, it's the cause, you know, fool, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. You know, we need to stop getting fooled by Russia. You know, I mean, Russia has not changed in mentality. It's not changed in identity form since basically, you know, the Mongols. Like, like I mean, it's, it's, it's extremely slight in the way that it's changed, you know? It's still an empire. It has colonies. This is a colonial war. It, I mean, this could have been waged 500 years ago and looked familiar, you know? And I mean, this, and it had been, right? I mean, the Ukrainians could tell you that, that it had been, you know? So we need to get smart. That's what I advocate. It's, I mean, if that's Russophobia, fine. But I, but I want to, I, I advocate realism toward Russia. I advocate finally seeing Russia for what it is. And this could change in the future. I don't, I think maybe a hundred years from now, you know, it's possible that Russia decolonizes like every other European empire has, every single other one has, you know, and there, there is some successor state, let's call it, you know, Moscovia or something like this. I mean, I've, I've sometimes put it in the same form as like the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire dissolved, Ataturk had to create a whole new identity called it the Turk. The Tur Turkey was founded and, you know, maybe one day there is a successor state that, that, you know, there can be some level of reconciliation with Ukraine once Russia recognizes its historic crimes, including the crimes of World War II, including starting World War II. You got to get past the whole great, great patriotic war fantasy and recognize the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and, and that they were allied with the Nazis in starting World War II. Um, but maybe after all of that, there can be reconciliation, but that's a long way in the future. And we got we to address Russia as it is today, which is a colonial empire that has over and over and over again thrown the world, thrown its neighborhood, thrown us into instability in order to pursue its colonial aims. That's true. I agree with you. You are also a part of Enough of Fellas mov movement. Yes. Can you explain what is it in several words and why I am part of it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, NAFO was, a, was sort of a, an amazing treat of this kind of, uh, you know, a, 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 totally unexpected of this, of this conflict, of the response to it, a, a groundswell of freedom-loving individuals from across the world who basically just went to kind of call out Russia on its crap. I mean, you know, like Russia pushes enormous. I mean, I don't need to tell you. It's, it's a disinformation superpower. I mean, Russia's a big lie, right? I mean, Russia's amazing advantage. Like, look, they can't, Russia's military is a joke. I mean, it exists to kill, rape, steal. It exists like, what, what Russia's whole strategy is is they lie to you, they lie to you, they, 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 they destabilize your system internally through corruption, through lies, through infiltration. And then once you're destabilized enough, they send in their horde <laughs> to, to, to destroy you. But their horde can't actually fight. You know, it, it, it's very bad at doing actual operations. Um, they need to destabilize you first. So, so fighting against that infiltration, fighting against the infoware, fighting against corruption, fighting against all that kind of stuff, that's in a, in a very real way where, the, where part of the war is, right? Of course, the war is on the battlefield too. You win on the battlefield, but Ukraine's showing they can win on the battlefield. Now we need to win the info war. We need to win the war against corruption. We need to win all this stuff that, that Russia. And NAFO basically is this groundswell against Russian disinformation. You know, I mean, that's what it is. It's, a, it's, a, it's an operation. I mean, it's, it's, it's decentralized. It's led by nobody. It's just a bunch of people that are sick of it, you know? And I mean, to me, it's really exciting because I think it's, it's, it's a very, it, it, they're, they're taking as their model, I think they're taking as their example, the Ukrainian people who are experts at decentralized organizing. I mean, this society is like, like Ukraine just will pop into action. Like when, when something's needed, networks of Ukrainians form to get stuff where it needs to go and get where it needs to go. And that is democracy at its most, you know, foundational level. Right? I mean, there's a, there's a democratic spirit in Ukraine, there's a democratic spirit in it that we've long since um, kind of ignored, in a sense, right? We've, we've come to see institutions as kind of the critical things. You know, are, you have, are your institutions clean? Are you having periodic, you know, regular elections, blah, blah, blah? All of this is important. It's important. But there is no democracy without Democrats. There is no democracy without the individual belief, without the self-organizing potential, without the engagement in the community and I think Ukrainians have this. I think NAFO demonstrates this, that it's kind of coming back. 
but I've always kind of, I've seen NAFO and I've seen the Ukrainians as, as kind of the, the, the uh, paragon of this self-organizing kind of self-responsibility. You know, like, like what do you do when something bad happens? Do you wait for the government to take care of it? Or do you take care of it? Do you get your people together and take care of it? And that, getting your people together and take care of it, that is foundationally democratic. Okay, and NAFO is like a part of informational war who help Ukraine, as I see it. And there was a point of view, existed point of view at the beginning of the war that Ukraine has won this informational war. And uh, it was point of view inside Ukraine. Can you comment it uh, from outside the Ukraine? So I think that Ukraine and NAFO, um, I mean, Ukrainians are experts in, in info warfare. I wish we'd do it more like them, right? I mean, the info war, first of all, I think the West has a tough time even seeing it as an info war. We usually address it as countering disinformation, which is the most sort of high nosed kind of uh, bureaucratic, technocratic way of addressing it. I mean, it really is, a, it's an info war. You know, it's a, it's a, it's basically a, a, a propaganda fight that Russia is very, very good at because Russia, Russia sees it as that. Russia sees it as like we need to, we need to get in, we need to destabilize, we need to, we need to get our lies into every nook and cranny, everybody's brain. You know, we need to, we need to cause questions, skepticism, everything we can. Um, and I think for a while we had them on the ropes. I think it's because Russia didn't expect. First, they didn't, they didn't. Russia wildly underestimated Ukraine. That's true. They did not. They did not expect Ukraine to be as good as count, at counter disinfo as Ukraine was. They did not expect NAFO to come out of nowhere and start just you know like trolling their ambassadors, uh, hitting them on all this information fronts. But I'm sad to say, I think our lead has kind of evaporated. I mean, for a lot of different reasons. I think you know one of them was Elon Musk's purchase of Twitter and 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 the way that that's all shaken out. That was like that was maybe like one battle that was like. Um, very decisive and kind of the Russian return. But I, but I also think, like usual, you know, we kind of got pretty far ahead. And then Russia figured stuff out and kind of counterattacked, you know. And we need, to, we need to never, I mean, Russia's major advantage is an info. They're very, very good at it. They so you, have very lot of money. <laughs> they have. They put a lot of money in it. I mean, they put a lot more money in than us. I mean, we have a lot more money than they do. If we'd if we'd actually fight back, we would. But I mean, Russia puts a lot of money in this, you know, and we should put a lot of money in it too. We should recognize that really the info war is a real war, right? I mean, like we're at a point right now where if we gave Ukraine everything it's asking for, Ukraine would win the war tomorrow. I mean, Ukraine. If there's no doubt about Ukrainians willingness to fight. There's no doubt about Ukrainians' commitment to, to fight. There's no doubt about Ukraine's war goals, which is a return to, you know, 1991 borders, liberation of Ukraine. But the partners are still kind of like, well, you know, what about, what about escalation? What, you know, whatever that means. What about, and that's, that's, a, that's a huge info, that's, I mean, that's an info op, right? I mean, that's a very successful info op. That's a very sophisticated info op. This isn't, this isn't like, you know, I don't know, the, the, the bio labs or something like that. Like they, they do both, right? I mean, yeah. Russia, Russia does bio labs to kind of get at the, you know, your, the rural, whatever. And then um, they do escalation to get at the sophisticated, oh, escalation, you know. Uh, oh, but what if we collapse? What if Russia collapses? That's very bad for you. Then there's instability, you know. These are all info ops. So it's been very successful and we've got to figure that out. So there are two ways, some insane ways of uh, disinformation they spread and some sophisticated ways of disinformation they spread. And um, from your point of view, how we can uh, protect ourselves from it? How we can fight it? Well, we have to, we have to first of all, recognize that this is an info war. You know, we need to, we need to do more, right? I mean, we need to, we need to recognize that it's, it's not enough to debunk lies. It's not enough to just tell the truth, which is, I mean, we, we have to tell the truth. But that's not sufficient. It's necessary, but not sufficient. We have to be really purposeful with our narratives, counter narratives. We need to be out there. We need to know what we're fighting for and talk about it all the time. You know, we need everybody to be out there. We, need to, we basically need to decide that we're going to win and, you know, and then talk about winning and talk about victory you know, and, 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 and just get there. I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of the problem is, is it's, you know, the, the Russians talk a lot about kind of like flooding the zone and that's kind of their their term for getting all this nastiness, all this poison out there. 
then we need to respond to flooding the zone with flooding the zone with truth. You know, flooding the zone with, with, with true narratives and with, with also, also ridicule for Russia's lies, right? I mean, I mean, debunking, I think, is really doesn't, fact checking, nobody cares because, because in some sense, Russia's information is meant to um, activate confirmation bias, right? I mean, if, you, if you're someone that's gonna worry about escalation in the first place, then they get you with the escalation. If you're someone that's gonna say, oh, well, the, you know, the CIA is blah, blah, okay, then they get, get, get you with the CIA. They're always going for your, okay, what, what kind of a person are you? And, and how could we- just fears. Yeah, what are your fears? And play off your fears, you know? So we need to be ready for that. And we need to give like opposite confirmation biases, you know, like we need to understand our audiences and start talking to them in a way that they understand and in a way that will get them interested in the truth. Okay, I have some serious questions for you. Uh, you are as a senior policy advisor for counter corruption and sanctions. Mm -hmm. So here are two questions. The first one, uh, how can you rate the corruption level in Ukraine? Well, um, Look, Ukraine has had a struggle with corruption. Um, I, th I don't think that's a surprise to anybody. I think Ukrainians are pretty, I mean, one of the amazing things about the country is precisely the civil society that's fought it. You know, I mean, Ukrainians are well aware of it. They have an extremely vibrant um, democratic system. Uh, it's an enormous topic in their politics. Every country struggles with corruption. Uh, every country is different. In the USA, there's kind of this revolving door, lobbyist style corruption also exists in Berlin. Obviously, a former German chancellor is working for Putin. I mean, that's pretty high level of corruption. Uh, in, in, in Ukraine, it's usually noted that sort of the judiciary has, I mean, the old Soviet style judiciary has corruption problems. I'll say that a lot of Ukraine's corruption problem was driven and exacerbated by Russia. Um, it was a weakness that, like, just like, you know, Russia does everywhere, where it looks for what are your cleavages, let's exacerbate them, let's, let's find ways to you know, tear your society apart. Um, one of those ways was corruption. The, 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 the Russians didn't invent corruption in Ukraine, but they certainly made it worse, you know? Um, and that's gone now. I think that you know, Ukrainian society is united against Russian influence, so it's very, it's very hard for Russian corruption to be as effective as it once was in driving um, Ukrainian society apart. But it's still, it's still an important topic, and I think Ukrainians are aware of it, and I think there's less tolerance here than there's ever been for corruption. I mean, Ukrainians, the young Ukrainians you speak with who are really driving this whole thing, both the Ukrainian defense, the future of Ukraine, they, they see a Ukraine with curbed corruption. Look, you never get rid of it totally. I mean, America has corruption scandals, you know? I mean, like, everywhere has corruption scandals. It never, it never totally goes away. But you get it down to a level at which it's no longer, like, the political issue. Um, and I think Ukraine will get there. And I think the Ukrainian people are determined to get there. And I think this is an opening to get there. And if, I mean, if it's, and if it's not achieved, then it's like, what was all this for? You know, I mean, it, it, it certainly feels like Ukraine has a definite vision of its future in the EU, in NATO, as this, you know, beacon of, of, of liberty uh, in the world. And I think it's going to make it there. From the other hand, Russia also has a lot of corruption and mm -hmm. it helped Ukraine in this war. And um, how do you, how can you estimate, uh, will Russia fight corruption sometime? <laughs> will Russia fight corruption? Russia's, like, Russia's model is based on corruption. How can they possibly fight corruption? I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, I mean, Russia's, I mean, Russia, they'll set up whatever corruption fighting boards. It's all a joke. They use their anti-corruption laws to attack anti-corruption campaigners, you know? I mean, they put, they put, they, they put their anti-corruption people in jail th through anti-corruption laws. I mean, of course, that was the story of Sergei Magnitsky, right? I mean, it's like, you know, he, he revealed a fraud, so they, you know, killed him for it. I mean, that's what, but that's, but that's what they always do. Anybody, you know, it's, oh, no, that whole system is run through corruption. You know, and they, and they view corruption as a weapon, of course. You know, it's like their system is, it's their model. It's a model they want to export. They want, they want everybody to be as corrupt as them. You know, I mean, it's a, again, I don't think there's any surprise coming to Ukrainian, but, you know, when the Russians see somebody like the Ukrainians and they see somebody succeeding, they don't think, huh, that's nice. We should try to be like that. They think, how can we pull them down? How can we, how can we bring them to our level? You know, and that's what they want to do with the whole world. They want to make everybody as corrupt as they are. No, it's, 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 it can't fight corruption. The, the, the state form of Russia would have to evolve beyond empire, you know, to fight corruption. So, so, so I mean, Russia isn't even in a position right now, so long as that is colonies, it's really hard to imagine how it'll fight corruption because it, I mean, it's colonies it controls through corruption. I mean, Kadyrov 
is an excellent example of this, right? I mean, here's a guy who's just like, I mean, yeah, he just paid off by Putin. You know, I mean, he's just a, he's a crony. You know, Putin runs that country through a circle of payoffs, corruption, bribe or bullet, right? You, you take the money or we kill you, <laughs> you know? I mean, that's the, so that's the governance structure of Russia. Thank you. I just wanted to hear from the expert. <laughs> um, how all the impl implemented sanctions influence Ukraine, influence Russia, I think, and which additional sanctions from EU and USA we need to more to get more influence on Russia? Yeah. So, look, the sanctions environment. I mean, look, right after the war, the first few weeks, I was actually impressed with the sanctions environment. Like, I, I the, the, we, we clearly. We clearly thought a strong sanctions response would get Russia to back off. And that was kind of our error, right? Our error in believing that everybody thinks like us. That's kind of the, the, the West in particular has this problem of thinking like, hmm, we're a bunch of free market, you know, capitalists, you know, everybody, everybody must really care about their pocketbook. Everybody must really care about gas prices and inflation and all that kind of stuff that we care about. Russia sadly did not care about that. I mean, there was, a, there was an excellent, excellent sanctions response in the beginning, including the freezing of sovereign reserves, which was like, you know, the central bank. Everybody's worried about this whole notion of like Putin's war chest. You know, he's going to be able to hedge against sanctions for a very long time and prevent them from being powerful. But at the end of the day, we just froze those too, you know. The big mistake that kept Russia in the game last year was the lack of energy sanctions, okay? I mean, we, the, Europe kept buying gas uh, to some extent, kept buying oil, stopped coal pretty early. Uh, but now that's over. That took way too long. You know, it was, it was always, it was always the problem. It was always the problem was, was Europe's gas addiction in particular, energy addiction. That was of course, horrific, horrible policy that the United States had long been against, um, but was pursued by Europe in large part, not because of natural interest, but thanks to corruption, thanks to the co-opting of officials like Gerhard Schroeder, like Francois Fillon, former prime minister of France, like Karen Kneissel, former foreign minister of Austria. There's so many of these, that's top level. There's so many of these though that Russia paid off to create these deals, these energy deals that got Western Europe, you know, in particular addicted to Russian gas. Um, but, but a lot of that's over now. I mean, like, it's hard to be impressed with anything because this war shouldn't have happened. But Germany is off Russian natural resources, which, I mean, is a huge deal given that Germany basically built its entire future around buying Russian natural resources. Never should have happened, but there it is. Um, oil, you know, of course, we still have a China problem there. China can buy oil pretty easily, but gas is kind of irreplaceable, you know? So we still need to tighten the sanctions. There's individuals we need to tighten the sanctions on. There's companies we need to tighten the sanctions on. We could probably bring the oil price cap down. I think that's really important to kind of get, get at the oil. But Russia should have a tougher time this year. I mean, the, the, the big gas problem, which was the problem, is, should be over now. Um, it took a year. I know. Uh, and uh, it's a long time. Yeah. And everything is taking like a long time, especially weapon supply. Uh, how do you think, do the West want Ukraine to win this war? So all of this stuff should have been done before the full-scale invasion. Look, Ukraine has been at war since 2014. It doesn't, Russia invaded in 2014, right? I mean, like this is, they, they, I, think, I think Ukrainians are correct. They call it the full-scale escalation. You know, it's like, that's, it is. You know, this is a war that's been going on for what? Six, eight, nine years, right? I mean, like just you know, the math going on in my head there. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's something we should have done much, much, much earlier. Of course, Nord Stream 2 was built after 2014, right? So this wasn't, this wasn't even taken seriously. I mean, getting us out of this paradigm of Russia's a great power and, oh, we need to do deals with Russia and it helps that Russia, so there's this whole philosophy of like great power politics, but then also you got Russia coming with bags of cash to all our leadership and saying, hey, you know, when, you, some money. When, you, when, you're done, when you're done with your job here, we got a job for you. You know, you can come work for one of our companies and make half a million dollars a year. And they're like, oh, well, you know, that's not bad. And it is the end of history and blah, blah, blah. So you've had this horrible trend in the West over the last 30 years, very difficult for us to get out of, of what I'd call liberal triumphalism. This notion that we won the Cold War and yeah, there will be setbacks, but at the end of the day, the triumph of democracy is basically guaranteed. And this is, this, there's been ships away at this for a while, but to me, this fundamentally ended on February 24th. So it's taken a long time. 
it never should have taken this long. It shouldn't require endless kicking and screaming to get to every new tranche of weapons. It shouldn't take endless kicking and screaming to get to every new uh, set of sanctions. I mean, we're in the 10th sanctions package with the EU now, right? Um, it shouldn't take this. And I understand Ukrainian frustrations. I want to explain, not justify, just explain that the West has been living in a fantasy world for 30 years. I mean, I've, you know, I've seen it. I've been there. I've worked, you know, in, in, in government for 10 years. And I mean, I've, I've seen the fantasy happen right before my eyes at a point at which we really shouldn't have, we really shouldn't have had this fantasy any longer, but it, but it remained because there was a lot of greed. There was, I mean, it was, it was a mix of greed and just wishful thinking, uh, 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 a kind of notion of, oh my God, if, if we're wrong about this, if we're wrong about the, the triumph of democracy, that means a closed world again, a second Cold War, uh, you know, we have to batten down the hatches. And it was kind of this almost like, well, don't look at it, you know, hear no evil, see no evil. We just don't want, we don't want it to be the case. So we're going to ignore it, <laughs> you know. Um, and now we can't ignore it anymore because, because of the Ukrainians. Because you guys, basically, you fought. Nobody expected you to fight. You're winning. Nobody expected you to be winning. And you basically looked at us and you were like, Hello? <laughs> like, 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 I mean, these are your values. Like, you need to wake up. You need to get back here and start defending things again. You need to remember who you are. And so we started to remember. But, but, we, but it's been a long time we were asleep. A long time. So we're still, I mean, I'm, I'm very sad to say, we're still sort of rubbing the, 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 the sleepy times from our eyes. But we have the same problem with weapons now. Like, we wait for too long. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean that's the, I mean that's the that's the big question. Can we make this next step to, essentially saying Ukrainian victory is what we want? I mean we're we're stuck in the, as long as it takes, or we're stuck in kind of the, the the hedging mode. Of not really knowing, what's going to happen, of, not wanting to. I mean there's there's also kind of a fear of victory, right? Kind of like a. Oh, what if Russia uses a nuclear weapon or instability in Russia? This is what I'm talking about, these narratives. We talked about that earlier. A lot of these narratives, we need to debunk them. We need to, we need to fight against them. We need to ridicule them. We need to, we need to get us through the dam that's been built by Russia of, of kind of info tactics and to like, wait a, wait a second. Obviously, Ukrainian victory is what we want. What, what are we doing this for if, if we don't want Ukrainian victory? Why are we giving them weapons in the first place? I mean, why are we doing any of this? If we're not trying to achieve Ukrainian victory, I mean, Ukrainian victory is good in a moral sense. It's, it's morally right, but it's also good in a, just a pure national interest sense. I mean, you look through the U.S. national security strategy and it's like Russia, 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 Russia and China, Russia, Russia and China, Russia, Russia. And it's like, I mean, oh, my God, when in history have we been able to knock out one of our primary adversaries without a single trooper, without a single person on the ground? without a single jet in the air. The Ukrainians are just doing it all, and they're doing it for what is essentially pennies in our, in our, in our national security budget. I mean, this is like a rounding error of stuff we're giving Ukrainians. So, so it's just, we need to get through that information uh, dam, you know? And, and it's hard. It's hard because there's fear, you know? Change is hard. It's the, it's the devil you know versus the devil you don't. You know, and I mean, we're just not, I don't think Berlin, Paris, Washington, I mean, I think there's still hesitancy to say, okay, we're done with Putin. Okay, we're done, you know, potentially even done with Russia. And, you know, the new paradigm in the region is going to be a strong, whole, independent Ukraine and, you know, a strong and strong partners too, a strong militarized Poland, a strong, you know, I mean, when I look at that, I think, well, heck yeah! <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's like, I mean, I mean, you know, like think about it for two seconds, and it's like, why wouldn't we want that? I mean, look at what I mean, look at what Russia's done for us. That's because you're ambassador of Ukraine. No, uh, I mean, I mean, again, I mean, I mean, I want to, I want to be really clear. You know, I'm thinking about this from the American perspective. I'm an American patriot, and American patriots should want to support Ukraine. They should want to see this region and think, oh my God, in Central and Eastern Europe. There are a bunch of countries and peoples who have the same fundamental values as the United States, the same commitment to freedom, the same commitment to independence. These are natural allies for us. And who are they fighting against? They're fighting against 
what is it? What we've identified over and over and over and over again is one of our primary adversaries. So let's quit the crap. I mean, let's just, you know, like, let's, let's quit the, the, the warmed over, endless kind of hand wringing, circular thinking. Let's just embrace it. Like, I mean, this is, like, this is obviously good for us. Okay, as an American patriot, answer me for the question. Will the United States help Ukraine after the elections? Yes. You mean the presidential elections? Yes. Yes. I mean, there's, there's support in America for Ukraine, you know, that goes much deeper and broader than anything you might hear in our political debate, anything you might hear on Twitter, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I mean, look, Gallup, the, the, this latest Gallup poll, you may have seen it, shows 62% of Republicans, 58% of Democrats view Russia's invasion of Ukraine as a critical threat, as a critical threat. I mean, that's like as high as it goes to U.S. national security. The other saw it as important, but not critical. So it's not like, it's not like the second one was like, oh no, we don't care. It's like, oh, it's important, but not critical. So, so um, big majorities of both Republicans and Democrats, and actually more Republicans than Democrats, very interestingly, view Russia's invasion of Ukraine as a critical threat. So I just, you know, look, there is a, this is what I was always trying to tell people too, even during sort of the, the Trump administration was like, America's not just the president. It's not just, you know, the institutions of the executive branch. It's not just the loudest members of Congress. You know, it is the people. It is the constitution. It is the values that have defined us for 250 years. I mean, we've been a, around for a really long time and it, we've been amazingly consistent. I mean, like, it, it was a, like right after the revolution, right after 1776, some of those that fought in the revolution went to go fight in wars of independence in other parts of the world. We've got Americans right here, this is pointing to one sitting right over there, you know, fighting, fighting for Ukraine, you know, in the, in the spirit of America, right here, right now. You know, we had them in the Spanish Civil War. You know, we have them all over the place, because that's America. And America goes a whole lot deeper than whatever our most recent political candidate says. Um, so I, I just, I just, you know, I really want to encourage people to see kind of the support that we have for Ukraine as, you know, much more inherent in U.S. DNA. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think even, you know, even those who just discovered Ukraine kind of can get the very essence of this, which is the Ukrainians are us. The Ukrainians, it's 1776 over here. You know, I mean, the Ukrainians are a, are a, a, a tough democracy fighting against a tyrannical empire. And I mean, what is more American than this? Not to mention that it's like 100% in our national security interest. I mean, it's, it's so rare that you see these two things align, but here it is. Okay, last several days you have traveled in Ukraine a lot. Uh, what have you seen and what uh, impressed you in Ukraine? It's not your first time, of course, but... Well, it was my first time in the Ukrainian South, <laughs> and I loved Odessa. I, I, so so what, a, what a town. So that was, that was a lot of fun. Um, we went to Mykolaiv, which, of course, hero city. I mean, you know, it's, it's amazing after having withstood the, the horrors of Russia. I mean, life is pretty much back to normal there, you know? I mean, it's, it's amazing. I think it just goes to show you just how resilient, you know, Ukrainians are. We went to Kherson. Um, now Kherson, not back to normal, understandably so, because the Russians won't let it go back to normal. We have artillery in there every day, sniper fire. Um, Kherson is, is tough. I mean, the, the, the Ukrainian armed forces there are tough. You know, they're holding it down. And I mean, eventually Kherson will be like Mykolaiv, right? I mean, when the, when the front moves, when, when Crimea is liberated, when the counteroffensive is successful, um, her son will return to normal, just like Mykolaiv returned to normal, because so the Ukrainians are, you know. Um, so it'll 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 be miraculously normal. Right now, though, it's you know it's they're still holding down the fort. Um, was briefly in Dnipro, um, you know. I mean, I mean Dnipro's in good shape. I mean, we 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 went and went and saw the you know where the where the terrorist attack occurred uh, at the apartment buildings. I mean, obviously that is you know beyond tragic. I mean, it, it kind of really demonstrates the magnitude of, of Russian evil and what Russia has done to the Ukrainian people. I mean, you see, like, there was a line next to the bus stop, you know, all the uh, sort of uh, stuffed animals and, you know, the, the, I mean, these people were just living their, <sighs> living their lives. Refrigerators open, you see food in the fridge, you see the 
the clothes in the closet. It's like, I mean, it's, it's surreal. There, I mean, there's nothing military near any of this. This was just clearly Russia's, you know, tactic to, ter to, to attempt to terrorize the Ukrainian people into submission. Um, of course, this has only made Ukraine more determined to win the war, but it, you know, I mean, it also is like, wait, we need to get, we need to get Ukraine what it needs to protect its population centers, because, I mean, this is, a, this is a terrorist state. I mean, we need, to, we need to recognize what we're up against here, you know, how Russia operates. This is terrorism. I mean, this is, their tactic is literally terror. They're trying to terrorize Ukraine into submission. Um, so that was, that was really sick. Um, and, and I think we finally need to sort of designate Russia as state sponsor of terror. Um, and then finally, I'm here with you. <laughs> Have you some plans uh, on travel in Ukraine? Because, you know, uh, there are a lot of invitations from girls on Twitter <laughs> for you in different cities of Ukraine. <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> the, the, the invitations normally don't affect my travel plans, let's say, you know, I'm trying to, trying to first things first, go where, you know, where needed and, 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 and see things that others may not be seeing and, and be able to, I mean, obviously, you know, I, I never got an invitation to her son, you know, um, but, but that was really important to go there. Um, you know, I mean, I, I want to go to every city, you know, I mean, I want to, I want to see all of this place, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm blown away by every city I'm in, I'm, I'm blown away by the energy, I mean, I, there's, it, it, you know, I, I got across the border from Palanka into Ukraine, you know, the border with Moldova, and just, I'm um, smiling the whole way back in Ukraine, you know, the, I mean, it's, the, the energy is in the air, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's this spirit of resilience and a spirit of defiance, that to me, I, I would almost define as quintessentially American, and yet here it is, you know, um, and it's and it's exciting to see. So I want to, I mean, I want to go everywhere, you know. I want to go everywhere and meet everybody if I could, you know. And but I mean, this is my this is my third time here, since the full scale invasion, you know. I intend to come back, um, and I intend to see new cities, uh, and you know, after victory, I intend to spend. A longer period of time here, I think, you know, um, hopefully we'll, we'll not only be working on reconstruction then and, and, and ensuring Russia, you know, one of my one of my things I work on even in kind of my professional life, but, uh, you know, making sure Russia pays for Ukrainian re reconstruction. Um, but, you know, also having a good time doing it. I, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that after victory we're, you know, we'll all be uh, having a nice party. I invite you to liberate it, Crimea. Oh, thank you. I can't wait, you know, that's my, that's my great dream is to one day own a beach house on Crimea, you know, my, my, my Ukrainian getaway. <laughs>